All right, let's get a big shout out to all our waterfowl fans out there. We know uh, most of us have already been duck hunting. If not, you're really close to the season opening. Uh, welcome to another episode of the Express Waterfowl, State of Waterfowl series, uh, COVID uh, version. We're doing this again via Zoom call. And tonight's a special night. Uh, we've got some special guests with us. We have John Devney, Senior Vice President of Delta Waterfowl. And we also have Ed Penny, Director of Public Policy for Ducks Unlimited. So welcome guys, thanks for having you here. And uh, we also don't wanna forget, we got Jim Ronquist holding the fort down in Stuttgart. And we also got Casey Short, who's uh, in Memphis tonight. So thank all of you guys for being here. Great to be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks, thanks Doug. So before we go any further, uh, John, let's, why don't we do a little quick bio on you guys. Uh, John, won't you tell us what you actually do for Delta and what your role is? And then when you get through, we'll switch over and let Ed do the same thing for his role at DU. Yeah, well, thanks, Doug. Um, well, I've had the great pleasure. I just, uh, just last week celebrated my 22 year anniversary at Delta. So I started a the day after Veterans Day in 1998. So I've had a real opportunity to work across a lot of big portions of the organization. And um, it, it's been a real blessing because, you know, it's pretty unique to be able to see the organization from where it was in 1998 to where it was today. But, you know, today my focus and my efforts is really on both US and Canadian policy. Um, focused on what we can do in the public policy realm, you know, all the way from local up to federal uh, to do good things for ducks and duck hunters. And, and so that's where I spend most of my time. And I have the great pleasure of working with really good people like Ed Penny, who are doing the same thing over at Ducks Unlimited. All right, Ed, won't you give us a little history on yourself at DU? Sure thing. So I'm, I'm the director of public policy for DU here in the Southern region. So I cover New Mexico all the way over to Virginia in the Chesapeake Bay. I'm based in our original Mississippi office, which is Jackson. Uh, so, you know, most of my work is in the Mississippi Flyway as well as Texas, all the way over into South Carolina. Uh, but my home is Mississippi, born and bred here, Mississippi State graduate, proud bulldog. I uh, got a cowbell here behind me, uh, but I and I won't ring it for everyone's uh, for everyone's joy. But I'm I'm proud to work for Ducks Unlimited uh, because I believe that we are a voice for wetland and waterfowl conservation here in the North American continent. And I love to do policy because I like to talk to people about how important our policy making decisions are to people that we all live with and grew up with and hunt with. Uh, as a waterfowl biologist by trade, uh, I think that I've got a pretty unique perspective. So I try to bring that to, to other folks' attention as much as I can. Well, again, thank both of y'all for being here. It's an exciting night for the State of Waterfowl series. And if you've been following us, uh, we have created this series to present as much factual information as we can about what's going on in the waterfowl world, specifically the Mississippi Flyway. And so uh, we're not out here to voice opinions and, and to give you our, our thoughts more. We're out to bring in the experts and present the information that allow the viewers and listeners out there to formulate their own opinions on what's going on in the world of waterfowl. So thank you guys again for being here. You know, um, when you look at society as a whole today, it doesn't, you don't have to look very far to see that people have kind of become real, uh, trying to describe this the best, they, they draw a line in the sand really quick. You're either on one side or you're on the other. And, you know, whether it's through the politics of government, turning on the news, it's, it's one side versus the other side. It's very rare that you see people come together in the middle. And so, one of the reasons we have both of your organizations here tonight is, is, is I think a little bit of that has happened, at least here in Louisiana. You know, I see on the street, you know, oh, he's got a Delta sticker or he's got a DU sticker, you know, and, and 
I don't know where along the way we started doing that and maybe it's just society in general, but we're starting to lose the big picture of things that yeah, Delta may have a little different perspective than DU and vice versa, but at the end of the day, we're all doing something for the good of waterfowl. And that's what we wanted to talk about tonight and is let you guys at least tell us what's going on in each of your organizations and try to at least let the public know and the general hunter out there what really goes on behind the scenes with these two organizations. And so with that being said, both of you have already mentioned the word policy multiple times, even in your bio. And I don't think, you know, most of our hunters, they go, they get out before daylight, they watch the sunrise come up and hopefully they get to shoot a few ducks and have a great time. And it never once crosses their mind what had to happen before they could go to the field and actually enjoy themselves and all the, the laws and the regulations from, from farm bills to wetlands to limits, uh, you name it, there is a ton of public policy that goes on into the world of waterfowling. And so what, let's just take a little bit of time and let you guys tell us you know, exactly what is public policy and how does it fit in the world of waterfowl? And, and John, won't you go first and tell us your, your version from, from the Delta side? Well, yeah, and, and it's point well taken, Doug. I think most duck hunters sort of don't think about it, about how either their hunting experience or the birds they see is a product of public policy or the birds they don't see is a product of public policy. And, you know, I'll give you one example that I think sort of really sets it simply for hunters is most hunters would not be aware that the duck season takes an act by the Secretary of the Interior to open waterfowl seasons. So, you know, we the biologists count ducks and, you know, we're doing a little different than we used to do it, where we used to count ducks in May and then promulgate regulations in July and August and then start hunting these critters in September. So we do it differently. We're using last year's data to make this year's regulations, but it actually takes the Secretary of Interior who's a cabinet member of the, you know, the presidency, or the president's cabinet, to actually sign a document to open duck season every year. And if that doesn't happen, none of us get to go duck hunting. So that's, that's a real simplified version. Um, but there, you know, if you hunt on a refuge, that's a public policy issue. Uh, if you're shooting ducks from the U.S. Prairie Pothole region, there's all sorts of policy factors in play why the U.S. prairie pothole regions become more important over time to duck hunters in the Mississippi and Central Flyway. So all that has a real bearing on what ducks, what, what the experience a duck hunter has and the number of ducks that that duck hunter sees. So I'm sure Ed will have more to add to that. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the reason that I got into public policy. Uh, because of the enormity of decisions that elected officials make regarding the things that we all care so deeply about. That could go from the potholes in the Dakotas to the rice fields in Arkansas and Louisiana to the refuges in California. I mean, all of this, as you mentioned, Doug, is, is connected to policy and these these decisions, these places, these things that we care about don't just happen. Uh, people have to make decisions about them. It's John and my job to influence those decisions on behalf of duck hunters. Uh, and, you know, waterfowl enthusiasts, we're trying to influence the people that John mentioned, Secretary of the Interior, the President, your U.S. Senator, your Congressman, your State Legislator, even your county supervisor in a lot of cases when we're dealing with access, uh, we stand up for that. Uh, and I'm thankful to have somebody like John as a friend. I trust him 100%. We work closely together on issues important to all of us. Uh, and, you know, I think the main point of everything that I'm gonna say tonight is this stuff doesn't just happen. Manna doesn't fall from heaven for ducks. We have to make it happen. Hunters have to make it happen. Land managers have to make it happen. Farmers have to make it happen. Voters have to make it happen. So I hope as, as this conversation evolves that we start talking more about it. You, you mentioned the word 
phrase work together. I think when when most guys talk about Delta and talk about Ducks Unlimited, they never put the two together to think they work on one project together. But from talking to you guys, it sounds like y'all actually come together on, on quite a few issues. What are, what are some things that the two uh, different organizations are working together on? You want to start, Ed, or? Sure. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll say just from my standpoint as a, again, a proud graduate of Mississippi State, I had colleagues that had research projects. They were doing waterfowl research projects funded by Delta Waterfowl. I never worked for Delta, but a lot of my friends and colleagues did. Uh, and these folks are professionals. I mean, Delta Waterfowl is made up of professionals. DU has professionals. We all care about the same things. And, you know, we all have our different missions, but the mission of public policy engagement is priority number one for me. And, and having John on, on working with me has been fun. Uh, it's a real relationship. It's a real friendship. Uh, we're working on farm bill issues. We're working on conservation funding issues at the federal level. Uh, you know, we're getting things done. And, you know, John, how, how many priorities have we identified that we've, we've accomplished? I would say we're probably, we would probably get an A, an A grade, if not A plus. Yeah, I mean, what really sort of catalyzed a sort of formal partnership, Doug, was going into the last farm bill and, you know, farm bills are big things. And I don't think much, many duck hunters or most duck hunters really appreciate how big the farm bill is. But I'll give you one example why it's so big. One, about three lines of the farm bill are protecting more than 70% of the prairie wetlands in the U.S. prairies right now little thing called swamp buster that unless you're a duck guy or a North Dakota farmer, you'll never hear about, you'll never know about. Um, but it's issues like that is, as Ed mentioned, the sort of magnitude of effect that we deal with when we talk about public policy. So take, you know, North Dakota in the peak in 2007, when we were peaked out of CRP, we had 3.7 million uh, acres of nesting cover in CRP. It was cranking blue wing teal and gadwall and shovelers and pintail out like crazy. And the U.S. taxpayer was paying $120 million a year for one program in North Dakota. And so the scale of effect is so massive and so consequential. I'd make the argument there'd be few things that happen in North America that have a bigger impact on breeding ducks. And so going into the, that last farm bill, it was sort of, you know, we were having these conversations between ourselves, our colleagues at DU, colleagues at the California Waterfowl Association, Delta Wildlife out of Mississippi, the National Shooting Sports Foundation, that we said, you know what, we need to get together. And we got together in Arkansas. We might have shot a duck or two. Um, and we laid out a <clears throat> list of five shared priorities for the Farm Bill. And I will tell you that we delivered on 100% of those priorities. And, it was, and we fared better than many of our colleagues did in the general conservation world because we were working together daily, weekly, monthly to be effective on those five priorities. And, and listen, they haven't all met their full potential yet, um, but we continue to work on that together as well. And, and those outcomes ultimately are gonna be great, great things, both for ducks and duck hunters. And, and a big reason for that is the high level of collaboration, the good partnerships, and, and frankly, the, some of those relationships were in place, but th that mechanism going into the Farm Bill was really the first formal effort to develop shared priorities and start to work together in a formal way. Ed, you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, I, specifically, which priorities are we talking about? And the Farm Bill, I take it for granted when, when I talk about the Farm Bill. The Farm Bill is, is one of the biggest acts that Congress passes every five years, and it is the biggest conservation package that Congress passes every five years. 
think it's $1.3 trillion total in the farm bill. Uh, conservation programs within the farm bill are a very, very small percentage. I think it's six or 7% of that. Uh, so we're not talking about a ton of money for conservation, but we're talking about priority programs like the Conservation Reserve Program, which John mentioned, CRP, which retires uh, farmland for a period of years. And in the Dakotas, it's, it's replanting grass. It serves as nesting cover, it's protecting wetlands. Down here in the South, we're talking about restoring bottomland hardwood forest and doing more soil management. Uh, you know, there's things like the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, RCPP, which Doug, you know very well. It's a, it keeps rice on the landscape in California, in Arkansas, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas. Without rice, we do not have ducks in those states, just simply because of the amount of food that it provides. So RCPP is a huge priority. Uh, CSP, Conservation Stewardship Program, there's things like voluntary conservation easements, which protect wetlands and restore wetland habitat across the country. Uh, those are important programs, but the most important thing is Swamp Buster. If we do not protect prairie wetlands and wetlands that are important to breeding waterfowl, we will not have ducks. No matter where you are, we will not have ducks. So that is the biggest priority every five years is to make sure we protect those wetlands not from farming, but from permanent drainage. That's a key point there. We support farming, DU supports agriculture. It's obvious in every part of the country, but we cannot support permanent drainage of wetlands. And as a duck hunter, we should all care about that. Uh, we're supporting other programs in the farm bill, but really those are the key ones. Swamp Buster and then the other, pro the other incentive programs that support habitat management, and farmers doing what they do on the landscape. Uh, I think the farm Wait, Jim. Ed, just to elaborate a little bit, the swamp buster bill or swamp buster phrase has been around duck hunting, duck biology circles for many years. There may be people listening to this that don't know exactly what swamp buster means. Can you elaborate back to even if, even if it's a little redundant on exactly what the Swamp Buster Bill is, so folks really understand the importance of that? That's a great question and a great point, and I'll let John jump in here too, but you know, in 1985, I was, I was not talking policy back then. I was, I was still, uh, I think I might've been in first or second grade. <laughs> 1985 was, uh, was when Swamp Buster appeared, and that was, the Swamp Buster provision basically said, hey, if you were getting federal dollars in any way, shape, or form, commodity payments, conservation payments, you cannot farm, or excuse me, you cannot drain the wetlands on your property. Uh, that's been in existence for a while. It's happened in every farm bill since. It's important just because it's, it's kind of the backstop for all of the other conservation programs that we do at the, at the federal level. Yeah, and just to sort of buttress that, I mean, you know, if you look at the U.S. prairie pothole region, and again, it, which has become more and more important, you know, partially because U.S. prairies have become more productive, but partially because the Canadian prairies have become less productive. And the reason the Canadian prairies have become less productive is because of the loss of these small weapons. And, you know, we were joking to talk about pintails earlier. The reason we don't have pintails like we used to is we've lost a lot of small wetlands in Prairie Canada. So Swamp Buster becomes, and, and this is one of those points where if you're thinking about Delta and DU that may at times have divergent perspective or divergent programs, and, and we certainly have different missions and, and everything. And we have our, you know, I think, unique strengths and weaknesses. This was why working together on the farm bill was so important because the use number one priority was Swamp Buster and Delta Waterfall's number one priority was Swamp Buster. Well, if that's the case and we convince other people that it should be their top priority too, why wouldn't we force multiply 
and work together to be as effective as we could on that issue. And, you know, if you look at the consequences of losing Swamp Buster, put it in a Mississippi flyway context, you know, you all will understand that we've had liberal duck seasons now since, Jim, I don't know how many times we've been making that bet since yeah. 1998. But we've well, had, since 1995, actually, because we went from 30 to 40 to 50 in 95 and then AHM, mm -hmm. and then we went to 60 in 97. So, yeah. Right. So we've had liberal duck seasons every year since we've been under this new regulatory format, which, you know, if you're a hotel or a guide in Arkansas or Louisiana is important because days are what matters, right? Days are what drives economic activity. And, and days kill ducks. And days kills ducks. And, and what, you, what you find out is if you do a post hoc analysis that if you scrub those wetlands that we would lose by losing Swamp Buster, there would have been many years, like half the years in the last 15 years, where you would have had a 30-day duck season instead of a 60-day duck season. And so think about that for, again, the average duck hunter is never going to understand the, the nuances of the farm bill. Most duck hunters will never understand Swamp Buster. And listen, I didn't understand it before I came to work for Delta. And, but it is absolutely essential to maintaining strong fall flights of ducks and providing the kind of, you know, hunting opportunity that we all care a lot about. You bet. Along with that, John, I know something you've been very involved in in Canada is the Alice program. How, how does that connect with Swamp Buster and CRP in the U.S.? Yeah, the, I mean, what, what happened there, Jim, is, you know, in the late 1990s, we were looking, our Canadian friends and colleagues, and, you know, we operate just as DU does. DU's got a, you know, sister organization across the 49th parallel, and we're one organization across the 49th parallel. And, and our colleagues across the border were looking down and saying, holy cow, look what happens when the U.S. government invests in conservation at these scales. And, you know, you start talking about 3.7 million acres of nesting cover in North Dakota and in Swamp Buster in North Dakota and all the investment that the American taxpayer makes through ag policy to conservation. And they got pretty envious. Um, and, and so we've been advancing that for many, you know, since the late, late 1990s is sort of the formative stretches. And listen, it's Canada invests less money in ag conservation than any of the G7 nations, which is pretty remarkable when you really think about it. And, mm -hmm. and those of you that have been to Canada know that, you know, southern Canada where most of our ducks that, well, you guys certainly care about, mallards, gadwall, pintails come from, it, it's intensively farmed. It's not the wilderness. And, and so Canada does not have the tradition that the U.S. has or that other sort of big agri, you know, big agricultural countries have in investing back in conservation. And so it's been in fits and starts, but in just in the last year, Jim, we worked with the government of Manitoba. Uh, the government of Manitoba implemented wetland regulations to, to cease drainage of type three through five wetlands, so seasonals to permanents. And we worked with them to get a pre-election commitment last fall, and now they're delivering it um, to protect 90% of the small type one and two wetlands through a voluntary incentive-based program. So I think for ducks and duck hunters, that's, you'd think that you'd accomplish more than that <laughs> over those timelines, uh, but we'll take that as an outcome, and, and we're hoping to press forward with that across the prairies. Cool. Sean? I'd like to step in here for a second. We've talked about some, some things of interest to me. We mentioned uh, Swamp Busters. We mentioned AHM a little bit in passing. I've been kind of privy to look at some telemetry data on mallards that we released last year, and we're starting to see that the mortality rate on our birds, though it may be anecdotal, is much higher than what AHM accounts for. And you look at the quality of water in the Dakotas this year, it kind of raises a, a question if the water is that good and mortality rate is that high what's the issue and i think we're, we're touching on it a little bit with wetland drainage so i kind of want to hear your guys thoughts on that if you think there's 
more and more being drained, what's driving that, if it's, you know, ethanol subsidies or what's kind of causing some of this to come out and be put into production. And as a, as a farmer, I definitely see both sides of that sense. I can see if you own the land, you want to get profitability right. out of it. Then I get that, you know, but as a conservationist, I see where we've got to protect that too. So it's a very fine line there of how to handle that. Yeah. I mean, the, the reality is, Case, and then listen, North Dakota's loss is, is an incredible wetland resource that North Dakota has right now. You got to remember, we've lost 50%. I mean, we have 50%. We only have half of the wetland resource that was here when Lewis and Clark came up. And you've lost 99% of it in Northwest Iowa and the Des Moines Lobe. You've lost over 90% in Minnesota. So listen, there's a reason why these guys drain these wetlands. They're not bad guys. Um, right. They're business people. And, and these things represent a liability to producing a crop. And what Swamp Buster did was basically said, what we don't want to do is provide subsidies and incentives that facilitate wetland drainage. It was this recognition that the American public was trying to suck and blow at the same time. And what I mean by that is we want cheap Cheerios and we want clean water. Well, the reality is that's a hard thing to get, right? Because this country's thrived on low commodity prices and cheap food. And, and it's a national security issue, frankly. And so we had to find a way to manage this quest for cheap commodities and cheap food without having extraordinary, you know, sort of natural resource degradation. So that's how we got there. Um, to follow up to your question, Ed's an actual biologist. I just pretend to be one, so he may have some thoughts too. But one thing we should always remember about birds with telemetry packages in them, they die more than birds in the free flight population. And so there is a transmitter effect. And it, and it doesn't mean we shouldn't put radios on birds, but we always have to be, every, every single study of wintering ducks with transmitters shows a far higher, more lower survival rate, higher hunting mortality rate than what we know is, is out there based on the banded sample. So right. what I will say is, you know, the reason females die on the wintering or on the breeding grounds is not because of dry wetlands. It's either they almost only die for one reason, and they almost only die because of predation. Um, and and you know you look at the conservation reserve program in, in North Dakota alone. We've got half the nesting cover provided by the CRP program that we had in 2007. That means we're putting those nesting females in places that it's harder to escape that predation risk, right? And so figure in, you know, figure in less nesting cover than we had 10, 15 years ago, figure in some radio effect and, and the fact that there's out there lots of things, including all of us on this podcast that like to eat ducks for a living. <laughs> Um, so, you know, and I, Ed, what are your thoughts on that? You, you probably know way more about radio effect than some poli sci major from a, you know, liberal arts school in Minnesota does. I was more of a habitat guy than a duck squeezer, but uh, <laughs> the, the main point I think there is right. And, and leg bands do provide good information, uh, compared to telemetry, uh, but you got to, Catch you got to catch banded birds more than once to be able to to figure some of that out. Uh, but going back to to what is killing ducks, foxes kill ducks. I'm not. I don't want to get into this too much, but until you go to the prairies and see that a mallard or a pintail nests in grass a long way away from the nearest water, you wonder are these really waterfowl or are they upland game birds? These birds nest a long way away, and unfortunately, CRP has kind of become a buffer type program where we're taking out productive margins of unproductive margins of fields, which is very important to, to maintaining the viability of a farmer's income and revenue and operation. Taking out whole fields from production is also important to duck survival. Uh, and when you see vast fields of grass, 
ducks are going to do better. When we protect uh, native prairie, when we protect ranches that are composed almost entirely of native grass with potholes interspersed, that's good for ducks. Uh, and if we are going to more of buffer type practices where we're taking out fence or we're, we're restoring grass along fence rows and edges of fields, we've got to protect big blocks of grass. And while corn producers are important, cattle ranchers are more important for ducks than anybody in the Dakotas right now. And we've got to protect big blocks of grass. These ranchers want conservation easements. They want to protect their livelihood for future generations, for their kids and grandkids. And beyond CRP, we got to be talking about protecting what's already out there. Right. And, and grassland easements, wetland easements are a way to do that. Uh, but that how do what are other ways we can do that ed how can we keep that going or maybe maybe we need to figure out how to educate the duck hunting masses on the importance of keeping that grass there um the combination of predators and grass i think are huge when populations are up duck populations are up predator populations are up they're kind of they follow each other but the grass, bottom line, is the most important part when you talk about breeding waterfowl. So what more things can we do to get folks to understand that importance? Or how do we do a better job of protecting those areas? That's a great question. I think the first thing that we can do is buy a duck stamp. Uh, duck stamps, federal duck stamps, are the most important thing to protecting existing wetlands and existing grass and prairie pothole region. Uh, I think that we've protected something like 35% of wetland basins in the Dakotas. So we have a strong foundation. And honestly, I'm surprised that we've done that well to protect that many pothole wetlands up there. Uh, but we still have a lot of ground to cover. I think we have to protect at least four more million acres of grasslands and about 1.5 million acres of wetlands. Mm. Uh, I think the DU and the Fish and Wildlife Service figured that out. So just to provide that sufficient habitat base to support population in the future. But to your question, buying a duck stamp, buying two duck stamps, making sure everybody in your family has a duck stamp is the most important thing. That we can do. Yeah, and I'll, Jim, I'll just take one tiny exception with what you said is, Nesting cover is really important, but I'll take you to landscapes in the Dakotas where we've got incredible native prairie wet resources and no wetlands and there's no ducks. So we got to start with that little itty bitty prairie pond and then we want to cover the surrounding landscape and grass. And that, you know, and this is one of the things that drives me nuts about our society is you got a lot of people that claim to care about the environment and bag on ranchers all the time and bag on me if if you know the most compatible land use in the U.S. prairie pothole region and I don't care if we're talking about a blue wing teal or a pintail or a mallard is rancher and, and those guys exist in a very different world than our crop producers do they don't have the same safety net um, they're the markets are funky we saw that happen with COVID and those guys are on the ragged edge all the time. And so things we can do to work with ranchers, Ed mentioned, you know, Fish and Wildlife Service grassland easements, it, they're incredibly popular tools. There's 1,500 landowners right now in North Dakota and South Dakota that want to enter into that contract with the service. But we've got to find ways to work with ranchers to put more cover on the landscape, which will benefit their cow-calf operations, it will benefit water quality, and it will be much better for things like that we care about, like mallards and pintails. Very good. I can. I know, <clears throat> John, you're hunting every day right now, or every day you can in the Dakotas. I just got back from a trip last night hunting in Kansas and Oklahoma, and we shot several. Um, hatchier mallards and and some uh, some hatchier pintails you know and that was good to see you know hate they got shot in one way but another way glad we did so we could see what we had you know <laughs> so 
Um, that's that compensatory versus additive mortality question right there. But did see some young birds in everything that we harvested. So that's really good to see there's some production going on somewhere. Yeah, and I would say this year, just based on the way, you know, we were crazy wet here in the U.S., especially in eastern North Dakota and South Dakota to start the spring. You know, Manitoba was average, which is kind of the way Manitoba always is. And Alberta had some great places and had some dry places. And Saskatchewan was awful bloody dry. And and I think a lot of the production we saw take place this year took place in eastern and South Dakota and North Dakota. And, you know, we, listen, you got to be careful about anecdotes, right? We'll, we'll see what age ratios look like in the harvest from this year. But the anecdotal observation was, man, did we make ducks? And the most encouraging thing for me was uh, on opening day, we had a little itty bitty seasonal wetland north and east of here and and I bet you we saw five pintails for every other duck every other duck not just every other mallard or every other blue wing we saw five pintails for every other duck we saw on opening day which is encouraging to you know as poorly as pintail have been doing the last few years I, I resemble that thought the past few days we've had lots and lots of pintails you know so that's, that's I say Yes, lots of pintails. So it's pretty encouraging to see all that. You know, we just had 15 minute conversation and yet <clears throat> you wouldn't have thought that that was an aspect of the farm bill and such a minute one at that, as big as that farm bill is. You know, I deal with it with Gros Savon. We do rice farming here. And so I'm familiar with all those terms you guys talked about, but at the same time until just now sitting here listening to all the different things you know you don't really realize how big the farm bill relates to duck hunting and 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 ed you can elaborate on some of this you mentioned the rcpp thing we've been talking about swamp busting in the grasslands but we also carry those same issues down here in the south and you right. talked about regional conservation partnership program that's something new that just came out in the last farm bill where the government's just not want to give money away for incentives. And so they wanted to try to create incentives, incentives to get the private landowner to become invested in this. And I know DU just took off with this program and ran with it and got to be the most successful of, of not just conservation organizations, but to me, they just, they just, they, they created the model for a regional conservation partnership, bringing in a lot of private companies from, Walmart to uh, all your chemical companies that contributed a lot of dollars. Purina was even part of that. And a lot of that money went to the rice producing states to continue to put water on the landscape for rice production. Cause I don't think people realize how important rice has become to the wintering grounds of ducks when they come South with all the land loss that's happened that, that John talked about up North. It's also happening down South whether it be from development, coastal erosion, whatever it may be, we still continue to lose our wetlands. And yet rice is an artificial kind of a surrogate wetland where we're actually putting water on the landscape during key times of the year that give ducks habitat. And so rice has really kicked in and become a, uh, an important aspect of that. And Kaysen, you can elaborate to this because you're a rice farmer from the Arkansas region, but that's very important and, and that was all created through the farm bill also that's just another part of of how funds trickle down to create conservation on the landscape it, ed or casey you, you want to pick up on any of that yeah i was going to ask uh, if either either of our guests here can tell me i've heard a number tossed around and i forget exactly what it is but what percentage of say ag land be it rice makes up a wintering ground in the mississippi flyway that's a great question, uh, and I'm not a number guy, but it is very significant. I, I know in the Central Valley that it's it makes up the vast majority of waterfowl habitat. Arkansas, the same thing. Uh, there, and we know how many. I don't know how to how to word it right, but. Uh, 
if we took rice off the landscape of Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Texas, California, we would have to restore hundreds of thousands of acres of wetlands, if not millions of acres of wetlands, and spend billions to replace that. Right. Uh, the investment that we are getting from rice producers is well worth it. Uh, we're providing food for people and food for ducks. We know that what is good for rice is good for ducks. And through the program that Doug mentioned, the Rice Stewardship Program, the bottom line is what's good for rice is good for ducks. And we're trying to keep rice production sustainable. Uh, rice is difficult to produce, requires a lot of water, requires a lot of fertilizer, requires a lot of expense, a lot of utility costs. Y'all know that. Uh, what we're trying to do is make that more efficient uh, and to help keep rice producers farming rice because y'all have options to grow a lot of different things in a lot of different places. We want you to grow rice. So how do we help you do that? And the farm bill has done that. Agribusinesses come in. Uh, corporations like Purina and Walmart support it because that's part of their sustainability initiatives. They know that producing human food like rice producers do that also supports wildlife, supports water quality, supports carbon storage, is valuable to their customers. And that's invaluable. Uh, so it's, it's, good to, it's good to hear from y'all as producers talking about the importance of that. Uh, you know, I love to shoot ducks and geese and rice. I like to shoot them in the woods, but I'll shoot them wherever they are. <laughs> in Arkansas, yep. they like rice. In Louisiana and Texas, they like rice. So, yeah, you know, I'm not. I'm not picky. <laughs> well, I, I'm glad that you you talked about it that way. I think a lot of times, as we've mentioned, you know, swamp busting and everything else, uh, producers, ag producers, kind of get put in a bad light sometimes, especially private landowners and. I know we lost some bob white quail. You know, everyone farms all the way to the property line now. There's not hedgerows and fence lines. So a lot of habitat is destroyed in ag, modern ag, but it is vitally important. And there's a lot of producers that are really working hard to, to help too. So I'm glad you put it that way. Well, and the interesting thing, Casey, and, 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 you know, I reflect back, you know, when I first met Jimbo, Jimbo and I met for the first time in June in 1999. And, and I remember I made my first trip to Arkansas as a kid from Minnesota in the fall of 1999. And I remember what that landscape looked like in 99. We're coming flying into Memphis over northeast Arkansas. And it looking like an, from the airplane looks like an ocean interrupted by levees, right? And, you know, and I'm struck, you know, I'm older than I, I, I'm older than I feel like I am. But you know, in the 20 some years I've been going to Arkansas, I remember that experience very vividly, uh, being down there in 1999 and seeing water everywhere on the landscape. And then now coming down there now and not seeing nearly as much. And, and the reason for that is the, the guy that's making a living on the farm knows that if he keeps water on that rice field, his bean crop the next year is gonna have a 20% yield rate, right? Well, we can't ask we can't ask a farmer in today's environment. We probably well we should never ask them to overcome that twenty percent loss of income for him and his family for nothing, right? Like if we want ducks and we want the that habitat to be on the landscape, we're going to have to compensate that farmer at the very least for his opportunity cost of what he's going to grow on that the next year. And and so this is. This is the beauty of the farm bill, right? Is is we can the resources are there to do things like what Doug you're working on with RCPP, or in a situation that Ed and I've been spending a lot of time on to encourage post harvest flooding at big scales across the Mississippi Alluvial Valley because I I think it has big implications for duck distribution. I think it has really big implications for the average everyday duck hunter how things have changed in the last 20 years. But we can't expect that off the backs of, you know, working farmers. We're gonna to need to find ways to get creative and incentivize the kind of landscape that we hope to achieve. Hmm. 
Yeah, you, and the CSP program is a is a good plan for that. We're enrolled in that, and that helps offset some of the cost of flooding and helps incentivize as well. Go ahead, Jimbo. No, I'm I'm kind of just going to kind of accentuate on that. You know, we had a good we had a four inch rain what case in three weeks ago, roughly. Yeah, something, three or four. You know, mm -hmm. and it's 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 since it's gone. And <laughs> every field you go by here, there's a tractor and a disc in the field. Disc, I mean, it's a biological desert in a lot of places because I mean they're covering everything up. Now we may get uh, one of them big Arkansas Thanksgiving toad stranglers. We may get one and get another six, seven inch rain. But even with that, you, you provide water on the landscape, but you don't have actual habitat. So finding ways to incentivize guys to, hey, let's let that. I mean, you're gonna work. You're gonna have to hit it again in the springtime anyway. Let's do it all in the spring. Leave some stubble, let some water stand on it. Leave some stuff for ducks and geese to use and find a way to make it for the farmer. And I understand that. A lot of buddies of mine farm for a living, but find a way to make it where it's not cutting into their bottom dollar, right. yet we're helping out the ducks and the geese. And, and really who I think we're helping out, to be really honest, because you know, and this is a conversation I've had many times, but God gave ducks and geese wings for a reason. And they're going to go find resources to exploit. Right. And if you're, you're the guy that doesn't have it, those ducks are going to be somebody else's problem or somebody else's benefit pretty quickly. I think the thing that if we can do what Ed and I have been working on for the last few years for Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Texas, California, you know, putting water back out on that landscape at landscape scales is going to help the average everyday hunter. Um, it's going to help him way more than it's going to help the big fancy private clubs. And, you know, you talk to guys in Ed's home state, you know, when we had the big hurricane, or when we had the big oil spill in the Gulf, NRCS spent lots of money to put water on the landscape early. Um, to try to keep birds from staying out of the marsh and being impacted by that oil. Well, I will tell you, every Mississippi duck hunter I, will, I know will tell you that was the best year they've had in the last 15 years for duck hunting because that water was there, the ducks came in, they imprinted on it, they hung around. Yeah, they got shot at, but there were places they could go where they weren't getting shot on every square inch of it, and they had a great season. So trying to replicate that, but again, the only way we're going to do that is we're not going to tell farmers to do that. We got to create the market signal that says this is a you know this is a good deal for you. You bet. Got to got to show this worth doing. You know right. for sure. No different. No different than taking care of our trees. You know whether it be a private track of woods or a public track of woods, we've got to educate people in the importance of taking care of our wood whether it be a natural flood or a green tree reservoir, you, you're starting to see t people. I know folks I've talked to about, Hey man, you want to talk to think, let's talk about how you, you put water on your woods. And they're like, man, we've been flooding them every year like that forever and ain't hurt them yet. We still shooting ducks. But yet you go in there, it's, it's changing from a uh, red oak composition <laughs> to, uh, to, to over cup and maple, you know? So what are you going to do there or sugar berry? So, Education is a lot of it, but how important is that? Let's look at how you think about rice production and think of the MAV and then think of our hardwood bottoms or, you know, how's that work together? Um, to me, I think it's very important as I look at the issues of what, Ed, we've had 13, 14 years in a row of overbank flooding in the White and Cache River Basin in the late spring, early summer when the temperatures start getting up in the 90s. Granted, that water's moving. They're getting some oxygen out of that, but still hurting those woods. You know, you see more basal swelling and tip die back now than you did 15, 20 years ago. So we're having a lot of problem. And I, I know you're aware, like Hurricane WMA, that we've lost 3,400 acres of red oaks up there. So we've got some issues, not only on our public, but on our private. And when you look at how much of our private woods that are in good management, yet they're losing ground because of 
either wanting to be able to run their 25 horse on opening day or they're just <laughs> stuck into whatever it may be, some sort of education. But the private group of woods is as important as the public group. So how do we go about moving that forward, educating those people, making sure that they're doing the right thing. So to me, that's that's the biggest question in Arkansas right now. And you know, I'm a southern southern guy. I work in the southern states. So that's what we're talking a lot about tonight. But you can say the same thing for whatever habitat type that you hunt the most. Management is the most important thing. And that's not just managing for right now, it's managing for the future. So if if you have to sacrifice a little bit right now to gain things in the future, we need to do that. Again, but my earlier point, this stuff doesn't just happen. Good habitat doesn't just happen. We've been blessed in the last three generations to have high quality flooded timber. Well, there's no guarantee that that'll happen. In the last 15 years, we've seen the decline that you just described. Uh, so how, how do we work on that? How do we address it? Um, you know, as a biologist, I've, I've seen and felt people not listen to me. I mean, as a, as a lobbyist or government affairs person, people don't listen to you, but Jimbo, they listen to you. You know that. I don't know about all that. So I would say maybe not just Jimbo, but everybody in the hunting industry has to start talking about this. Uh, you know, we all love to shoot ducks, but we all know we don't shoot limits every time we go out. Uh, so we've got to start talking about these habitat issues, whether they're on the prairies, whether they're in the woods in Arkansas, whether they're in the rice fields of Louisiana, close to wetland loss in Louisiana. Uh, we've got to be talking about that. And if we don't do something now, it ain't going to be there. In 10 years, it ain't gonna be there in 20 years, it ain't gonna be there in 50 years. And the ducks won't be coming, and our kids will not be shooting ducks. They'll be hunting deer, they'll be doing whatever they whatever it is they're doing. I want them to be enjoying what I enjoy and what y'all enjoy. Mm -hmm. And it's up to us to make those responsible decisions. And to me, it's really that simple. You know, I get paid to do this. I get paid to talk about ducks to you know, VIPs are important people, but VIPs and important people make decisions based on what their voters tell them to. And as hunters, as constituents, as citizens, we got to tell them what we want. And we want ducks in the future. We want wetlands in the future. We want, you know, high quality red oak timber in the future. We got to make that decision now and make it well known to them. Uh, so, you know, a few weeks ago when you were on the on a virtual, on a Zoom briefing with us, with some congressional staff, that made a huge difference. That made more of an impact with them than it does me having another meeting with these folks. So we as hunters have to do that. Industry, company, hunters, whatever you are, you gotta tell your, tell your elected officials this stuff means a lot to you. Yeah, so, I mean, let me just pipe in here for a sec. Ed makes a really important point. I mean. Listen, Ed and I put on suits, you know, a few times a year and jump in airplanes, go to Washington, D.C. But, you know, they may like us. Some of them like us more than other people like us. Some people <laughs> dislike us. Um, nobody dislikes Ed. There are a few people dislike me. But um, the reality is they understand by looking at our business card, we have a job to do and, and we're paid to do what we do. And we can talk smart and we can make great arguments and all the rest of that stuff. But if the, I'm going to, I'll po point out a real big one that's going to be coming in the next farm bill. Senator Bozeman is likely to be chair or ranking member of the Senate Ag Committee. The future of Swamp Buster will be in Senator Bozeman's hands. And there are Republican senators who do not like Swamp Buster his colleagues, people that he works with and respects. And there's gonna become, there's gonna come a point in that next farm bill debate where Senator Bozeman is gonna have the yank 
to support or not support Swamp Buster. And his staff is wonderful. They've got great relationships with BU. We built good relationships with them in the last farm bill. But if 500 Arkansas duck hunters said, don't you dare give away Swamp Buster, I guarantee you what Senator Bozeman will do. So reading between the lines there, we all need to be, whether we want to or not, need to be more politically aggressive or, or astute politically, more involved politically, talking about what's important to us, if I'm understanding that right. Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely, yeah. I would, I would say a little bit differently in that you just need to voice your passion, your dedication. Uh, you don't have to know who the, who the chair of Senate Ag Committee is. That's my job, that's John's job. But what you have to do is tell someone how important ducks and wetlands are to you. Don't tell your buddy, don't tell somebody you, you, you may be a Republican or a Democrat with. Tell somebody who you voted for or didn't vote for and still represents you. Tell them how important that stuff is. Uh, and if you need any help with that, I know John or I would be glad to help you do that because we're basically community organizers. We organize duck hunters to say <laughs> the things that we want them to say. And, and that's, that's because we care about it. And so, so what does the future look like for the next generation? You know, the, the young guys that are coming up, what, what does their future waterfowling look like? I, I'd say, Doug, we get to decide, right? I mean, you know, Ed talked about green tree reservoirs. One of the biggest problems we have in green tree reservoirs in Arkansas is Arkansas Game and Fish Commission has this incredible asset that we know is incredible because guys drive all the way from South Carolina with 15 foot, 1542s and 20 horse Tahatsus to access, right? It's a resource that nobody else has on the planet. The challenge is, you know, the infrastructure that is necessary to manage that asset is it's shelled out. I mean, we don't have the water conveyance. We don't have the, you know, water control structures. You go to Louisiana, you, you know, you look at White Lake in Louisiana. I mean, the infrastructure's, sh it's shredded, not just because of hurricanes, but because, you know, stuff gets old, you know, pipes break and they rot and all the rest of that stuff. Ed and I went through an exercise that identified priority infrastructure needs on priority waterfall refuges in this country and on priority state-owned properties across this country. We identified $250 million worth of projects on refuges. And we came up with, what was it, Ed? Like $607 million on state WMAs. Those are the Biomedas. Those are the White Lakes. I mean, these places have not received the attention that they need. Not only have they not received the attention from an infrastructure perspective, our staffing on our national wildlife refuges across this country is probably 25% of what it was in 2010. And so we don't have the ability to manage, we don't have the people to manage habitat, especially on the wintering ground. So, you know, our duck hunters and our, our elected officials as compelled by duck hunters gonna make the investments that are gonna take care of our wintering grounds in Arcan places like Arkansas and Louisiana? And are we gonna care enough about the prairies to make sure that this thing gets sustained? And, and this thing really, guys, will boil down to, you know, a couple votes a year and a big vote on the farm bill every five years is gonna affect the trajectory of where we're going with this thing. Um, and, and so, I mean, I think, I think that's why Ed and I love our job so much because, you know, we think we can have a disproportionate impact on the future of ducks and duck hunting doing what we're doing versus 
you know, Ed being a field biologist with DU in California or me running direct mail programs to help the waterfowl. This is where this is where we can have a disproportionate impact about the, the thing we very most care about in the entire world. And this whole episode is a prime example of, you know, we need to manage the resource. And thanks again to you guys and Express Boats for even allowing this platform to happen because just the few minutes we've been talking is a huge example of what is going on that, that the average guy has no clue of all the aspects of waterfowling that's going on from habitat across multiple different landscapes and ecotypes. Uh, it, it's really, this is some great conversation. I, I, we could talk for hours on this kind of stuff. So um, the, the point you made about the, the, the fish and wildlife services being understaffed and all that kind of stuff is, is this Great American Outdoors Act? Is, tell me a little bit about that. Is that is some of that stuff going to fit in some of that funding? Ed, do you want to start? Yeah, I'll, I'll start. And, and the Great American Outdoors Act was was a generational type piece of legislation. We've talked about the Farm Bill ad nauseum, but uh, Great American Outdoors Act included nine hundred million dollars for the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Uh, Land and Water Conservation Fund or LWCF is important to support recreational access, but primarily for waterfowl hunters, we're talking about helping to purchase easements in the Prairie Pothole region in the Dakotas. Uh, other parts of that act included uh, a fund to help address all the deferred maintenance backlog on public lands particularly for National Wildlife Refuges. We've talked a lot about national, or excuse me, water control structures uh, and the things that we use to manage water and habitat on public lands. There's $100 million a year for National Wildlife Refuges. So your local federal refuge could have access to funding to improve the things to manage habitat. Uh, and that was a huge win uh, and you know, there, there were other things in, in that piece of legislation. We're happy that President Trump passed that. And a few weeks later, or a few weeks ago, excuse me, uh, America's Conservation Enhancement Act was passed. That's the ACE Act. We have all these acronyms for things, but the EU's biggest federal priority was the North American Wetland Conservation Act, which was included in the ACE Act. Uh, that helps support wetland management infrastructure as well. It helps restore and conserve wetlands across the country. It helps protect grass, grasslands in the Dakotas. So these things have been important and without DU and Delta and a lot of other groups working together, they would not have happened. And I think back to your earlier question, I think the future is bright for waterfowl hunters, but it's not guaranteed. Uh, you know, We've done so much throughout history of this country for waterfowl, particularly in the last hundred years, but it's not guaranteed. And y'all know as well as I do that just because you have ducks this year doesn't mean you have ducks on your place next year. And the same thing happens in policy. And that's what John and I are, are responsible for is supporting waterfowl populations and hunters in DC and in states. And Doug, just, you know, I mean, Great American Outdoors Act in the ACE Act, you know, going back to my earlier comment about the high level of collaboration and coordination, those were two of the highest shared priorities between Delta, DU, California Waterfowl Association, National Shooting Sports Foundation, and Delta Wildlife. Those were things we put on a whiteboard last January as things we were going to get done. And, and again, I think now Land and Water Conservation Fund you know, there's a lot of people who have dedicated their careers to that. But I think one of, you know, this hundred million that's going to refuges, that's a direct result of us begging for it and working hard on it. Because, you know, let's be honest, what was sexy about that was national parks. And as Ed Penny will tell you, the Fish and Wildlife Service owns and manages more land than the National Park Service does. And so they have a really important need for deferred infrastructure as well. And deferred infrastructure 
in simple terms is Ed points out is the ability to manage habitat for ducks and duck hunters. And, you know, I, you know, I think the last thing a duck hunter needs is access to a place where there's no damn ducks. <laughs> and so if we want hunters to be able to enjoy public hunting, high quality public hunting on refuges, we got to be able to have riser board water structures that hold water in them and those sorts of things to make sure we can attract ducks to an area and hunt ducks in an area. And so that's a huge outcome. And again, it was, a, a, you know, partially because a high degree of collaboration amongst all these organizations working together to affect those outcomes. Well, guys, we've guys, already actually used up our first hour that we had planned on talking and I think we've just scratched the surface on what's to come. And if you're a listener out there, you can now maybe hopefully understand how special this uh, series of State of the Waterfowl is and, and how cool it is to get these two organizations together and listen to what's going on. So we're going to continue talking and continue this series. Uh, so if, uh, if you're out there listening, we're going to close out this part one of DU and Delta Waterfowl conversation. Stay tuned for our next episode as we continue talking about what's going on behind the scenes. Thank you all.